Okay. You've heard the passage that says, judge not, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge, this is in chapter 7, okay? The same way you judge others, you will be judged, and by the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye when you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, at the same time when there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Notice it says we're responsible to, take the, to help take the speck out of the eye, but it's how we go about it. It didn't say not to judge completely. This is talking about condemnation or censorious judging. It's not talking about any type of, of, of judging. And so God wants us to help our brother or sister. It's how we do it. I want you to see, we're continuing to look at the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, as we're still in that inclusio, expounding what it takes to have a greater righteousness than the scribes and Pharisees. And just say, just briefly, this does not mean to abolish law courts. Don't judge. It does not mean to suspend your critical faculties. It's a call to realize that you and I will be judged by the standard we judge other people. We're going to be held accountable for that. We need to t be in contact with our own heart. It's a call to judge ourselves first. What plank do you have in your eye? I like that. It must be painful, though. Good judging. What is it? It's a call by God to indeed make judgments with a humble heart and knowing where you're at, knowing your sin, knowing that you're not perfect. You're not just looking out for the specks in the other eyes without seeing it in yours. We're supposed to make judgments. Not judgmental judgments, but judgments from the right heart. We're supposed to take specks out of our brother's eye. In fact, we could not love anyone if we did not do this. These judgments, discipling moments, if you will, will be from a personal experience of truth. Listen to this. From personal battle with our own sin practiced out of love for the other person and for the advancement of God's reign and rule in the other person's life. It comes out of us dealing with our own sin. That's how we can help other people with their sin. If we're not dealing with that, it's going to cause damage. I had an example here, but I think I'll go on. It's an injunction against hypocritical judgment. You judge people with what you're judged. If you're not doing consistent there, even though you, you got to watch out that. And not with words of condemnation. Carson says it's not, you know, shouldn't, his disciples not to be judgmental or censorious. And uh, Osborne states, he was one of my professors too. That's pretty neat. It means looking down on a person with a superior attitude, criticizing, condemning them, without loving concern. So, it's hard, hypocrisy to make judgments in any other way. The issue is not whether the other person has issues in their life that need to change, but whether you are focusing on your life to let God reign to your life first so you can truly guide those who need help and rule in their lives. Okay, this is the type of heart that it takes to fulfill the law and the prophets and the righteousness to come through greater than the scribes and Pharisees. I'm not going to talk about verse 6. Uh, you can talk about that. But at verse 7 through 12, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Why does he even bring this up here? Well, this is becoming a summary. As you see down here at the final thing, he says, so in everything, do to others that you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. I think what he's doing in asking, seeking, and knocking is saying, hey, we have a good father. This isn't impossible to do what I'm asking you or telling you to do. This righteousness is not impossible because you're surrendering to God and he's going to live through you. You're going to fulfill the law and the prophets. It's not impossible. Ask, seek, knock. And reading my, my, some of my work in there, what I, what I said 
That might mean, well, maybe I have it here. So ask, seek, and not. I remember the strive that the Broncos had in the Super Bowl 1998. And you remember Dave Logan saying, oh, baby, they're going to win this thing. Do you remember that? Those of you who are old enough. But he got excited because he could see this is good. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. It's going to happen. Do we have that in our life? We're changing. We're seeing that things happen. I'm being different. God is helping me and helping other people. I'm going to make it. We're going to make it. I think that's what he's trying to say. We're going to make it. Trust. Seek. Knock. Ask. You can do it. God's there with you. And just a real fast, the golden rule, Jesus phrases it in a way that hardly any other culture does. It's a positive statement. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the rest of the cultures mainly say things like, do not do to others what you would not have them do to you. This is important because this fulfills the law. Jesus puts a ban on sins of omission. I can't do them all, but the grace is there. I'll try. And make mandatory good things you can do for someone. That is love. This is how this verse fits, in, uh, and I can talk about that. We have, how, will we have surrendered our heart to always, uh, in everything we want to do the best for the other person, just like God does? This is how we fulfill the law and the prophets. End of inclusio. It's all wrapped up in this, 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 uh, the, the golden rule. Now, the last section, which I'm not going to read here because we're out of time, but you can read it. This section here continues the uh, righteousness it takes to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that doesn't mean it doesn't say something about the law and the prophets, but that's not part of that part of the inclusio. In this section of scripture, Jesus, having laid out the surrendered heart, disciples must have to follow him or participate in the rule of God. He's done it. Now basically he calls for a decision. Okay, you know what the kingdom of heaven is now. You know what the Beatitudes, you know what the, the, the I've said to you, I say to, you've heard it's been said, but I say to you, those, those antitheses are, you've heard about how to pray, how to, how to fast, things like this, the heart to have. Jesus, having laid out the surrendered heart, disciples must have to follow him ask for a decision. He does this by painting four descriptions of two alternative ways to live and encouraging listeners to choose the way of life. Here they are. Two gates. Okay, it's been laid out to you, disciples. Two gates. There's a narrow gate. There's a wide one. It says there are few that go in the narrow gate. Many go in the wide gate. Few are going to be serving me and being with me even in heaven at the end. But very, and very many are going to be gone. Do we really believe that? And what would that mean if we did? There's two prophets. The good prophets and the bad prophets. The two trees, a good tree and a bad tree. They bear different types of fruit. Two knowings. You knowing God, God knowing you. Two foundations, one of sand and one on a rock. I'm not going to go through some of these, but I wanted to point out that about the judgment, we're supposed to be a fruit inspector. Wait a minute, what are you talking about? Well, you, we should be able to find people that come in sheep's clothing, inwardly or ferocious roles. It says, by their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or, or figs from thistles? And he goes on, he talks about that. So we need to be able to protect one another and keep people on track. Two knowings, this is so important. Matthew 21, 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There's your other inclusio. But only... He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we in your name drive out demons, perform many miracles? Then I will tell them, 
I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. It's so important to realize it's not just about us knowing God. And the word in, in the Hebrew and Old Testament and in the New Testament takes on that connotation of experience. Experience in a good way, actually, in this context, from Yada and Gnosko. Jesus is saying, wow, you did all these good things in my name, but I don't know who you are. I've never experienced your heart. Wait for me, you evildoers. What? If we don't have that two-way relationship with Christ, we're evildoers. I had a professor who said this is the scariest verse that most Christians have in the whole Bible. If you, I did my dissertation on this, so I can try to help you out if you need to want to know a little bit more about that. But it's key because it's relational. It's key because God wants to experience your good heart, and that is exactly what the sermon's about. That's exactly what the Beatitudes are. He wants to experience the expression in you of the Beatitudes. He wants to experience the expression of you in following what he said about the, the, uh, about the different things about uh, hate and, and uh, the antitheses, I should say. He wants to experience in you the heart for prayer, heart for giving, the heart for generous giving, the heart for fasting, the heart for all these things that's what he wants to experience. That's how he knows you. If you and I are just religious or even do miracles and things, and we don't have that, we failed in that sense. Failed to let God know our hearts. Does that make sense? And if we do that, then we're evildoers. If we're not doing that, letting him experience our good heart, he says we're evildoers. There's two foundations. One's a rock, one's a sand. That's pretty explanatory. What are you building on? Are you letting the kingdom of the rule of God live through you? Are you striving? Not, I'm not talking about perfection here. I'm talking about just letting him live through you, and that's your heart that you want that, and it's growing. If so, you're building on the rock. Jesus is not like the other the scribes and the Pharisees and teachers of the law. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught with one authority, not as the teachers of the law. Jesus is the authority of Christ, the teacher, Lord, Savior, fulfiller of the law of Moses, the one whom it pointed. He came to claims authority as God and judge. He didn't say, God will say, I don't know you. He said, I'll never, I say, I never knew you. He claims authority of the Son of God. He calls his God, God's God his Father. The Sermon on the Mount focuses on the surrender heart it takes to fulfill the inclus what the inclusios focus on. The heart it takes to allow the rule of heaven to flow through you. The heart it takes to through, through Jesus to fulfill the law. The heart it takes to put on Jesus and his righteousness for entrance into the kingdom or rule of heaven. Do you want this heart? It's not a matter of performance, but of surrender. Is your heart surrendered to Jesus to allow him to be all of this through you? If so, you will experience the joy of the Lord. And I was just going to share, but I think we ran out of time. I was going to have, I just wanted to say that's what it means to me in studying these many, many years, trying to figure out, okay, what are you trying to say, God? I said, he wants to allow him to, his, his kingdom, his rule to flow through me. And I want to try to do that the best I can with God's help. And hopefully that's what you want to do. And uh, I think I'll stop there. <laughs>